Hi, and thanks for tuning in. Today we're going to delve back into the world of biological chemistry and talk about functional groups. We'll talk about what they are, what they look like, and how they impact the biological molecules of living systems. So stay tuned. Hi, and thanks for tuning in. Today, we're back in the world of biological chemistry, talking about functional groups. So before we get started with the conversation, first, let's define what a functional group is. A functional group is a group of atoms that are responsible for the characteristic reactions of a particular substance. In biological chemistry, we're going to talk about a, a, a few different types of functional groups that are sort of like recurring themes with respect to biological molecules. They're found in lots of different types of molecules, and by understanding how these particular functional groups behave or what their presence means, we can use them to identify the types of molecules that we're dealing with, but also try to understand and predict how we expect those particular biological molecules to interact in a living system or interact with other biological molecules. In this particular video, we're going to show a lot of molecular models. You're going to see a lot of sort of chemical formulas, um, and I want to get you accustomed to those if you're not used to them yet. So for starters, we're going to see a lot of uh, atomic symbols. C for carbon, O for oxygen, H for hydrogen. And we're also going to see uh, bonds drawn. The bonds will be indicated by uh, single black lines. So for example, if you see a C with a line drawn to an H, you know that that is a carbon with a single bond to a hydrogen. If you see two bonds, for example, if a carbon has two black lines drawn to the O, you know that is a carbon double bonded to an oxygen atom. Okay. The other letter I want you to get used to is the letter R. In organic chemistry and biological chemistry, R represents pretty much everything else. Quite often, these functional groups are going to be located at the end of a molecule. So on one end, you have the functional group, and then R is everything else. So R could be uh, a large fatty acid tail. It could be the rest of a, of a carbohydrate. It could be the remainder of, uh, of the, the atoms that are in a particular alcohol, so on and so forth. So when you see R, you can understand that R literally represents anything upwards from a hydrogen to the entire remainder of a protein. Okay, So just a little nomenclature for you uh, before we get started. So what we're going to do now is we're going to talk about the different functional groups um, in order. The first one we'll talk about is called a carbonyl group. Now with a carbonyl group, you can kind of think of a carbonyl group as a bit like an adapter. A carbonyl group is a carbon double bonded to an oxygen with two R groups coming off of that central carbon. Now if you remember, carbon can form four bonds. It's one of the reasons why carbon is such an important atom in biology. It can bond to four different things, which gives a lot of molecular flexibility. So if carbon is using two of those bonds to the oxygen, it can bond twice more. With a carbonyl group, that, those two other bonds are quite often two other R groups, usually abbreviated R and R prime, or R if, in both cases if either end is identical. Uh, a carbonyl group doesn't do much in terms of change the characteristics of that particular biological molecule, but it does add a little bit of polarity. Uh, the oxygen is slightly more electronegative than the carbon atom. It pulls a little bit on those shared electrons, giving it a weakly negative pull on the end there. Uh, so it does add a bit of polarity, uh, making that particular the end of the molecule a little more hydrophilic. Remember, polar molecules dissolve well in water. Hydrophilic uh, it gives it a little bit of, of hydrophilic characteristics. Another functional group we'll encounter is the hydroxyl. Hydroxyl is kind of easy to remember. It's also very simple. It is quite simply a oxygen atom, single bonded to a hydrogen atom on one end, a hydrogen plus an oxygen, hydroxyl, and then that oxygen can form one more bond and shares that second bond with an R group. And any time you put an OH, a hydroxyl group, on the end of a biological molecule, it almost always becomes an alcohol. So you can see here the molecular diagram for methanol, which is the simplest of alcohols, you can see that you have your OH group here, your hydroxyl, the oxygen is bonded to the hydrogen on one end, and then to the, the carbon, the single carbon of methanol on the other. Of course, the carbon there can form three other bonds. It forms those with three different hydrogen atoms. Now, methanol has significantly different properties than, for example, ethanol, which is the alcohol that is typically consumed. Um, and as, for example, a major difference is um, methanol is highly toxic, 
whereas ethanol is significantly less toxic. So we don't drink methanol because um, it will make you go blind and or kill you. Um, but you can see they're both alcohols in the context that they have their hydroxyl group attached to them. But what happens if that hydroxyl group is attached to an R group and that R group ends with a carbonyl? Now that leads us to our third functional group. It's called a carboxyl. A carboxyl is very simple. Take carbonyl and add a hydroxyl and you've got a carboxyl, okay? So carboxyls are kind of neat. Carboxyls all of a sudden turn a particular molecule into an acid. We usually call them some type of carboxylic acid. Many organic acids, things like pyruvic acid, lactic acid, they end in this carboxyl group at the end. And the reason why is when you have that functional group with the carbon double bonded to the O attached to the other oxygen and the H, that H, that hydrogen can actually come off under certain conditions. It becomes a proton donor. It yields those hydronium acid equivalents. So whenever you see a molecule that has this carboxyl group stuck on the end of it, it instantly becomes an organic acid. Here's a great example of one. Here is what we would call a fatty acid. A fatty acid has a long greasy chain. That's the R group that's attached to that carboxyl. But at the very end, you have that carboxyl group, which gives it the property of being an, a being an acid. And that is why we often refer to, and we almost exclusively refer to as fats, as fatty acids, because they all have this, uh, this carboxyl group at the end uh, that gives them the properties of being an acid. Now let's look at something completely different. We're going to get away from the carbon as a central molecule. We're going to get away from it in this particular case, and we're going to replace that carbon with a nitrogen. And this is going to bring us to what's called an amine group or an amino group. Now, nitrogen can bond either two or three times depending on how it's interacting. And nitrogen is going to bond in this case to two hydrogens. And then the third bond it's going to share with an R group. Okay, now this amino group actually conveys a slightly basic quality to, uh, to, to the molecule because it actually can attract another hydrogen under prop, uh, proper, proper conditions, thus taking a hydrogen away from water, yielding a hydroxyl anion, making it kind of a base. But aminos are particularly important in terms of proteins because there's a special type of molecule called an amino acid. In an amino acid, you actually get by taking a central carbon and on one end placing an amine group and on the other end placing a carboxyl group, an amino acid. And it turns out that there are 21 common amino acids, 20 are the, those predominantly found in living systems, 20 common amino acids that are the building blocks for all proteins. And what's neat about having an amine on one group and a carboxyl on the other is they have the ability to bond so that when you look at a protein, you literally have an amino group, a central carbon, a carboxyl group, and then that carboxyl group is bonded to the amino group of the next amino acid in line. And that's the way we get polymerization of proteins. Proteins are built, be, built from amino acid building blocks, and it's the ability of these amine groups and these carboxyl groups to interact with each other to form these big long chains. Without the presence of these functional groups on either end, proteins as, proteins as they do could never exist. And without proteins, life couldn't exist. Another group that doesn't have carbon as its central atom is a, called a sulfhydryl. Now, sulfhydryls are also particularly important for proteins. A sulfhydryl group is quite simply a sulfur atom attached to a hydrogen, and that sulfur is then bonded to an R group. The reason why sulfhydryl groups, sulfhydryl groups are particularly important for proteins is this. Sulfhydryl groups, under the right condition, can drop their hydrogen atom and bond instead with the sulfur of another sulfhydryl group who has also lost its hydrogen. It's called getting ionized. And this forms what's called a disulfide bridge. Now, disulfide bridges are particularly important with proteins. Certain amino acids have sulfhydryl groups. Methionine and cysteine are great examples of that. They both have a sulfhydryl group as attached to their central carbon as part of their R group, if you will. Now, these sulfhydryls can then form these disulfide bridges linking distant parts of the protein together, giving their protein their distinct shape. 
And then if they get broken, if those sulfhydryl groups get broken because conditions change or you add things like heat, it can contort the protein into a different shape. I'll give you a great example. The major reason why some individuals have curly hair is the proteins that make up their, the molecules in their hair, or make up their hair fibers, contain lots of sulfhydryls. If you heat those sulfhydryls groups up, those bonds fall apart. The, the proteins relax in their structure and that straightens the hair. If you want to curl it, you can add certain chemicals that encourage the sulfhydryl bonds to reform and you end up with curly hair again. Kind of neat, right? But it is way more important than just whether your hair is straight or curly or wavy because lots of proteins that don't have some sort of visible uh, effect on your visible appearance are also, uh, are also controlled by these sulfhydryl groups. Another group that doesn't have carbon as its central atom is called a phosphate. Now a phosphate is what happens when you take a, a phosphorus atom and bond it to four different oxygens. It actually has a very strong negative charge. This is actually a negatively charged um, anion at this point because of the sheer number of oxygen atoms that are attached. So where do we encounter phosphates? Phosphates are hugely important first in terms of energy. One of the things we'll learn about when we talk about metabolism is ATP, adenosine triphosphate. It is the energy currency of life. It is one of the predominant modes that your body pays its energy debts. It's the thing that powers enzymes and transporters and so on and so forth. It's what majority of your metabolism or your catabolic metabolism is, is geared to making. That particular molecule has the presence and the ability to retain all of that molecular energy because of the three phosphate groups that are attached to it. Removing one of those phosphates, breaking that bond between the third phosphate in a row, releases a ton of energy that can then be used by enzymes and transporters and other cellular structures to do work, the work that's needed to keep that cell alive. It's also essential, for example, for DNA. If you look at the, the structure of DNA, you'll, we will learn that DNA has four bases and that those are attached to a sugar molecule called deoxyribose, which is then attached to a phosphate. And it's the alternating sugar phosphate bonds that form the backbone of DNA to give it some sort of rigid structure. Without the presence of those phosphates, those, that backbone will be a lot less rigid and DNA would have none of the behaviors that we need it to have in order to be functional. Moreover, the negative charge on those phosphates that run up and down the backbone give DNA as a molecule a net negative charge, which makes it significantly more soluble in water than it already would be without the presence of those phosphates. This is hugely important considering all of our cells consist of an, a, an aqueous solution called the cytoplasm or cytosol. So without those phosphates, it would be a lot harder for the DNA to, to dissolve and, and function normally in that aqueous environment. Now the last two groups we'll talk about do have a carbon as a central atom. And they're involved predominantly in influencing how DNA is regulated. So one of the things we'll talk about in a different video is the fact that DNA can, um, can have different structures. Uh, and the, the way DNA is wrapped around certain proteins that are called histones impacts whether or not those genes can be turned on or turned off. The next two functional groups, actually the last two functional groups we're talk, we'll talk about, are called methyl groups and acetyl groups. Methyl groups are the simpler of the bunch. They are quite simply a carbon bonded to three different hydrogens and then an R group. One of their major roles in biological context is to bind to DNA. They can methylate cytosine residues, the C's in the A, C's, T's, G's, that make up our DNA, okay? If they are bound to the cytosine, if they're bound to the cytosine nucleotides on DNA, that causes DNA to fold up very tight. And when DNA is very tightly folded up, the genes that are in those particular regions of the chromosome, in that particular region of the DNA, really can't be expressed, they can't be turned on, they can't be used. So it's one of the ways that our cells can regulate which genes are being active and which genes are not being active. To oppose that process, we end up with something called acetylation. And this involves an acetyl group. And an acetyl group is actually fairly easy. An acetyl group is essentially a methyl group attached to a carbonyl. So you've got your methyl group, and then it runs through a carbonyl, and then it gets attached to something else, an R group. In this case, the R group is usually a protein called a histone. 
our DNA and the DNA of all eukaryotic cells is wrapped tightly around these little proteins called histones. And when those histones get acetylated, i.e. an acetyl group is attached to those proteins, that, that DNA relaxes. It becomes much more loosely bound to the surface of those histone proteins, making it much more easily expressed. It's a way that our cells can turn certain genes on, or at least make them accessible to be expressed. So as conditions change, there's this alternating pattern of methylation of the DNA to silence gene expression or acetylation of the histone proteins to encourage genes to be expressed. Now there's a great deal of regulation that goes on to make sure this happens, but we'll talk about that in a, in a different video. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. I hope you found this video helpful. Um, functional groups are um, something that's hugely important for understanding how biological systems operate, mainly because they have such a profound impact on the biological molecules of which they are a part. I hope you understand now how to identify biological functional groups and, and how they can influence the molecules to which they are attached. Again, thank you for tuning in. I really appreciate it and I look forward to seeing you guys next time.